Theater in the 19th Century For theater, like most of society, the 1800s were a time of change. Technology was changing throughout society, and the new inventions were bound to affect the way theater was produced. Europe's farming economy shifted to an economy controlled by the big factories of the Industrial Revolution, the period of time when machines replaced hand tools in many trades. You wouldn't think that the invention of the steam engine would have a major impact on the theater, but it did. The steam engine made it possible to transport theater to areas that had never had the opportunity to see theater regularly. European stars and productions even began to tour with their shows in America. Even more important, the steam engine led to the building of large steam-powered factories, which offered hundreds and hundreds of new jobs. So workers started swarming into the cities. This trend, called urbanization, had a major effect on the theater. The crowds of people moving into the cities in Europe wanted entertainment, and the members of the growing middle class had more free time on their hands than ever before. Theater grew and grew in popularity. In fact, theater became a very fashionable pastime, an actual fad. By the late 1800s, theater and other live entertainment were in endless demand, as common to the people of that day as movies are to us today. This great popularity of theater resulted in the construction of more and larger playhouses. After 1817, these new theaters were lit with gas, a vast improvement over the constant need to replace the hundreds of candles that it took to light theaters prior to the use of gas. The way in which plays were written during the 1800s was also changing. During this period, there were three main types of plays, romantic plays, well-made plays, and melodramas. The romantics, writers who wrote in the romantic style, rejected all the current artistic rules, stating that if the playwright were a real genius, he or she needed no rules, such as those that had dominated the neoclassical period. Romantic plays are noted for the way they created a feeling, an atmosphere, and a mood, often at the expense of believable plots or characters. The Romantic playwrights believed that there was no subject matter inappropriate for the stage. They built conflict in their plays between the characters' spiritual and creative wishes and their physical inabilities. The second type of play that was popular during the 1800s was melodrama. Melodrama emphasized action and spectacular stage effects, and was always accompanied by music and song, which helped establish a tense mood for the play. These dramas were designed to pull on the heartstrings of the audience by pitting good characters against bad characters, heroes against villains. The main characters in melodrama were either totally good in nature or totally evil, making it very clear which of the two the audience was to applaud. This form of theater has remained popular in various forms, often comic, up to our present day. You've probably seen some light comedies in which a villain in a dark cape and mustache is defeated by a hero. The third category of drama popular in the 1800s was the well-made play. This name refers to the structure of the play, which builds to a climax through a development of plot events that take place logically and in a cause and effect fashion. In a well-made play, the audience has all the information it needs to understand all of the characters, and the play constantly foreshadows the action to come. There are no surprises changing the expected outcome of the plot. The action moves predictably forward as new information is discovered by the characters through means such as letters or documents. The surprise endings to plays, which had been so popular in earlier periods of history, lost their popularity as the new scientific and mechanized society demanded reasonable, logical endings. During this period, interest in the theater was beginning to revolve around the popularity of certain stars, rather than around highly popular playwrights or play titles. Stars such as Sarah Bernhardt in Peleus and Melisande, Edwin Booth as Hamlet, and Eleanor Deuce drew great crowds and were very influential. Deuce, for example, was an influence on Stanislavski, and contributed to his development of a new method of acting, which you'll read about later. This period could be thought of as an age of stars. While the actors were becoming more powerful and more well-respected, the theater was developing a new artistic position, the director. 
As you will remember from earlier history sections in this book, prior to this period actors were largely self-directed. The actors decided where and how to say their lines, most often under the supervision of one head actor, who gave a few suggestions about how to deliver dialogue during a very few rehearsals. This practice began to change radically in the late 1800s. Individuals, known as directors, tried to create a unified stage picture, in which all of the visual elements of the play matched each other and visually suggested the same historical period. The directors also began to take great care that all costumes and set designs reflected the fashion popular at the time of the play's setting. This meant that more rehearsals were needed to coordinate these unified choices. Important early directors include Madame Vestris and Henry Irving in London, and Richard Wagner and the Duke of Saxe-Meiningen in Germany. <laughs>